Ireland pursues an independent course in foreign policy, but it is not neutral between liberty and tyranny and never will be. Congo got its independence from Belgium on the 30th of June 1960, and this was part of a, a wind of change that was moving through Africa in 1960 and 61, countries getting independence from their former colonial masters. Some countries managed it well, some didn't, and the Belgians didn't manage it well. Uh, Congo got its independence, the Belgians withdrew, and then almost immediately the new government of Patrice Lumumba faced a number of crises. It was completely incapable of, of governing, it lacked experience, and the army, the force publique, uh, mutinied. And so the country began to collapse uh, only days after getting its independence from Belgium. So the instability in Congo caused by the collapse of the, or the, the near collapse of the uh, new government was one of the reasons that the UN had to get involved and involved very quickly to try and prop up what looked like becoming what we now call a failed state. Another problem with Congo immediately after independence was that Congo being a federal state, a number of the, the provinces that made up the country uh, declared their independence. Uh, one of these being the mineral rich province of Katanga that held so much of the world's supply of uranium and other precious strategic metals. In July, the war got out with out that the UN wanted uh, an Irish battalion for the Congo. And at the time, the papers were full of the Congo news, independence, mutiny of the, of the local Congolese military forces. Uh, Patrice Lumumba, he was the prime minister. He was noted for his speech at the, in the, on Independence Day in the presence of, of the Belgian king and a lot of others. He said that, uh, that the Congolese would no longer be the king's monkeys. So that didn't go down well with the, the local white and Belgian population. The Western Bloc, the Soviet Union, the uh, United States, all had vested interests in stabilizing or destabilizing Congo. And it seemed that the one neutral body that could come in and try and stabilize uh, Congo was the United Nations. The UN took flight. Uh, Belgian forces were asked to withdraw. There was widespread panic and trouble and atrocities, you might say, and Russia threatening to intervene. The UN headquarters in New York, led by Jack Hammarskjöld, saw this as an ideal situation for the UN to try to establish a peacekeeping role for itself. So it set about organizing battalions from neutral countries, including Ireland for one. And that's how the 32nd Battalion came about in late July. When the request came through from the UN Secretariat, from Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld, for Ireland to provide a contingent, Aiken jumped at the possibility because it was absolutely part of the obligations and responsibilities that he, as Minister for External Affairs, expected uh, would be uh, part of Ireland's UN membership, that Ireland was now showing actively its engagement with the UN. I had managed to persuade the beautiful Aer Lingus hostess to be my wife. And we were planned to have our marriage on um, in September 1960. So along came mid-1960 and of course the Congo exploded on the international scene. And all the defence forces were asked to volunteer for overseas service. So I did, as soon as everybody else, we all volunteered to a man I think. Well in 1960 I was married with three children. I was uh, living in the city and stationed in Collins, Barracks and Cork. I went in of a Monday, little known at the time that this would be a life-changing experience for us all that particular day. But when the announcement came on the around the middle of July that there was a troop going to the Congo, 
on the very first peacekeeping mission by an Irish battalion. Teeth inspected, see what a stand up to six months in the Congo, and rushed back up to Dublin, told to pack my bags. I was going to the Congo. They had suddenly discovered or realised that French was the language in the Congo and that this young innocent officer who was just commissioned would probably be a very useful addition. Now, of course, this caused mayhem among our families because we had our wedding uh, arrangements all made for September. So we decided to bring our wedding forward to the 13th of August. But we only had six days left uh, after that before I left. So to her, to her eternal credit, my wife agreed to a six-day honeymoon in a most unexpected location, the Curra Camp, where uh, six days later I found myself at Baldonnell in the bowels of a Globemaster aircraft taking off for wheel of space. My mother got a call, I think from my father, saying he was being transferred to the Congo. Uh, she was very upset. I think she had a fear of darkest Africa. In July then, the 1st Battalion was formed, and uh, 32nd Battalion, and I was uh, nominated to be in charge of a Guard of Honour for Sean Lamass, the Taoiseach, when the 32nd Battalion paraded through O'Connell Street before they left. Now up comes July 1960, Congo. I was a young sergeant at the time. I volunteered. I was not selected. So I was quite happy not to be selected. I was on the range the following day. So I came home that evening from the range and I was told, you're picked. So-and-so got cried off and the other fellow failed the medical. Went home and told my wife, my young 20-year-old wife. <laughs> we both fully didn't understand. We were both in kind of numbed by the whole kind of thing. I suppose looking back on it, and it's very vivid to me, the memory of that particular day, the, the discussions, looking for maps to find out where we were going, uh, what was going on out there. It was very hard to get information. Families didn't know what hit them. The men wanted off for the adventure, and that was that. Time went on then into August, and the government was asked for a second battalion. And I was lucky to be appointed as uh, a platoon commander in uh, A Company, number three platoon, A Company, 33rd Battalion. So that was it. I was on. And before I knew what, I was carrying the flag down O'Connell Street in front of a parade of 700 men and officers. Down through Dame Street, across the bridge, into O'Connell Street with crowds cheering on both sides. The excitement was unbelievable. But the French and the flag carrying and the ADC thing all put me there in the front of that battalion. I was thinking going home how I was going to preach this to, to my, my wife. Well, unfortunately, it's not with us anymore. And um, I was saying, so I said, I went into her and I said, I'm volunteering for a trip abroad for 24 weeks. For all those years, six months. One of the reasons uh, so many volunteered, we had have this kind of mundane type of lifestyle, and um, this is, here's an opportunity now we're all of training, maybe for into practice. I remember I getting a torch, some snappy underwear, and pajamas. First time in the army, soldiers ever got an issue of pajamas. Um, our equipment wasn't really suitable for overseas, but nobody said nothing. We still had our hobnail boots and our heavy uniforms and grey back shirts. Uh, going out, but um, there was no complaints. Everybody just got on with the job. I do remember uh, the company was brought by bus and sold to the Dublin Zoo to see what kind of animals they might see in the Congo. But as it turned out, we didn't see any except a few snakes. And I didn't even have time to, to, to visit or talk to my aged parents in the country on the morning of the 22nd, of course, heading off. And at 6 o'clock that morning, she made breakfast. We kissed, I hugged the baby, and we said goodbye. Now, um, she said to me, God, she'll be eight months when you come back. So I got on my bike, 
6.30, cycled off for Collins Barracks. It would be much easier, actually, to face with execution than the way I felt that, I felt that morning. I think it was the most heartrending thing of all my life, actually. I never forgot it even to this day. I was going down the road on my bike and I said, oh, Jesus, you haven't even told your mother and father that you're going. So I was going to the Congo and that's it. My neighbour said to me, I'll collect the bike this evening for you, Dick. He said, I got a letter after that and he said, I went up that evening. There was no bike there. He said, so that was the end of the bike. <laughs> Starting College Barracks, where the company were paraded and addressed by the Lord Mayor of Cork, Alderman Steve, Stephen Barrett, I remember. He said very fine words to us. We were blessed by the chaplain and the barrack square, addressed by the General Officer Commanding of the time, and then we were um, into trucks and off to the Curra. I had did many parades in my career, but in this particular one, people were cheering and clapping. Thousands of people, they clapped the whole way down. It was a marvellous send-off from the, from the people of Dublin that time. Oh, they were delighted. My mother, actually, when she was in her younger days, used to teach just outside the Curra and had a great fondness for the army. And she was absolutely thrilled, as was my father. They were proud. They were delighted. The trip out would probably be considered fourth class. When we arrived at the end of the parade at the Rotunda, we were all then unceremoniously piled into trucks and driven out to Baldonnell. From there, then we were herded on to the Globe Masters, where we sat in funny kind of chairs back or backs to the fuselage. And for the trip out, we had a various of temperatures, even at one stage sitting on ice. And this American pilot came over and he gave us a brief and he asked us, and, and he was ever fly before. So we said, no, sir, and good Cork accidents to him. And he um, he told us a flight plan where he was going. He said, we're flying from here, he said, to Evreux in France, and then on to Tripoli, and and, and then on to Cano, Nigeria, and then on to Lipoville in the Congo. Everyone was issued with a plastic bag with an apple, an orange, two sandwiches and a bottle of milk. So here we've gone off to our plastic bags <laughs> up onto the plane. But I can tell you they were useful because we used them. On we went to the Globemasters anyway, Hercules, 130 higher planes. Most uncomfortable thing of all time, you sat in a strap seat with your knees crunched up and if you stretched your legs you kicked somebody else and he left you out of it like but you didn't hear what he said anyway because the sound was terrible. You wrote, you wrote, actually wrote notes to the Philippi Sides if you want to talk to him. And the best unit is units all from the one unit and all from the one area. But I can tell you that this mix and gathering that I had turned out to be one hell of a friend bunch. There were no combat uniforms available in those days, and no tropical uniforms either. Only the green home issue, which was... Uh, it's a good quality and serviceable for home use, but not exactly serviceable for the tropical climate. I had French. I was translating for anybody, everybody. So it was not translation, but then it was very often been sent off on any kind of odd job that turned up. We landed there, and when the tail of the plane opened, it was like walking into an oven. It was really warm, hot, and of course we weren't dressed for it. I remember. Um, Sergeant there, American Sergeant asked me where we were going to North Pole. Colleagues and my friends there, the NCOs, they, they, like, they work really hard and I think they got the opportunity to show their work as well in, in going out and being able to do all these jobs they got to do overseas that they wouldn't have got at home. You realised an awful lot of things when you landed in Quilas. The heat was terrible in your dress. Some of the soldiers took off their tunics and slacks and put on their newly issued first time out pyjamas. We went from, from there then, we were heading right into it. We headed for Kindu on the equator. First thing that happened when we got off the plane, the airport, Sergeant Irwin, pick six men, you're on guard here. So I was on guard and got four, ten, four babies and our rifles mounted, stay there. And my orders were, you're on guard, we'll collect you in the morning. 
Fortunately, it was an American base and there was air conditioning. And when we got into that, I said to myself, this is exactly what it'd be like going into heaven if I ever make it. And at Camino, our job there was to deny those the, the airport to any hostile forces. At that time, uh, La Mamba had got some Russian Aleutian aircraft which they thought had the potential of landing with us and taking over the base. So we had to deny that to them. So the way that we did it was to put trucks on the airport, uh, on the runways. Uh, the rest of our supplies were by air to the airport. And one of them was a small plane, a single engine plane. Uh, the door flew off and we were met with a gust of cold air for the rest of the journey. Uh, and the second plane was uh, a DC-3. Uh, a fire broke out in a, in a, in a, in a compartment behind the, the pilot. But the second pilot uh, spent the next half hour with fire extinguishers uh, extinguishing the fire, which he did, but the cabin was full of smoke for the rest of the journey. The officer said to me, Sarge, you go in the lead truck. So I said, James, I'm in the lead truck. I'd want to know where I'm going anyway. And so I went into the office and I said, um, have we got a map of this giant like where are we going to? And the man said to me, oh, no, you don't need any map, he said. Because you go down there, turn left, he says, and go 200 miles, and you'll be happy. You'll be there. Also, on my faint memory down in Camina, outside the, the base where I was working, there was a piano of some sort, and I used to play it occasionally, and the young black people used to come up, and I'd have them dance around the, the piano. So it's... It wasn't doing any harm anyways. You could get into some sticky situations, it's the soldier's job, but I've been in some situations there that, because of the language, it became very dangerous. And uh, if you haven't an interpreter, it's very hard to communicate. And unfortunately, to the Congolese, Blue Beret didn't mean very much. You were white, and everything white was Belgian. A group of our people arrived by convoy with all our stores. Uh, they arrived by road from Albertville. Uh, it was a harrowing journey, and their stories were harrowing of unrest on the road and bows and arrows and locals shouting at them and stopping them and things like that with roadblocks. They had a river to cross, which led to hours of negotiation and things like that. So it was a, an eye-opener for us that we realised that things were not great in the location. We were 90 kilometres on a road that was continually being washed away. And in fact, it, our only contact was by helicopter when they were available. But the helicopter used to bring a, the White Father's priest out to say mass to us every, every Sunday. It, because the road was so bad, he couldn't go on the road. So we, were, we knew we were on our own. If, if we were attacked, and there were umpteen scare stories all the time and no better people than the Belgians I'm afraid to keep saying there's thousands of balubas here there and everywhere we were forever feeling these things. So we had built up a good understanding and relationship with the Belgian paratroopers which I think possibly did help in the taking over situation in Camina base where we ended up. Camina base being a huge NATO base with vast area uh, to control. It was a great opportunity to have a job to do as well as all the translating. So I always kept busy. And post had a monstrous effect altogether on the soldier. If the soldier didn't get post, and then if they went on from two, three, four weeks, you could see that it was affecting them. They were looking into the sky, like, and looking out into nowhere, kind of feeling about the whole thing. And when the post came, you could see the eyes lighting up. You could see them sitting around with the letters. Naturally enough, they all the big smiles. Then you could see a poor devil, like, oh, got nothing. All these fickers have letters, I have nothing. Katanga was the only place that there was any trouble. But it was the only province that was trouble because it was the richest province in the country and it was owned and what have you by large international 
businesses. Peacekeeping as such was now beginning to go out the window, leading inevitably uh, to something called peacemaking. Our mission there was, um, we were told to stop the Russians from landing. I rode home and I told my mother where I was and what I was doing and that I was um, there that the uh, Russians might land in the place. You know, she had a great time telling the neighbours that uh, her son was out in the middle of Africa and he was stopping the Russians from coming in there. There were numerous nationalities out there. There was Indians, Pakistan, Nigerians, you know, Mali. The Irish soldier uh, is unique in that religion, colour, it means nothing to them. They're, they're mixed with everybody, friendly with everybody, friendly with the Congolese people, who are a gentle people, by the way. On the day they looked for reinforcements for Niemba, Kevin Gleeson was the one that was in reserve, the platoon that was in reserve. So he was put on the plane to go there, with fatal uh, results for poor old Kevin. Something happened there then that really um, upset everybody. Uh, there was our troops were killed in Nyamba, so we had no we had soldiers going home in coffins. I was on duty with my platoon at the airport that morning when the, my signal had come to me, and he said, "Jesus, there's eight fellas after being killed." He said, "Nyamba, the lads that went down you know, last week." You now that had a, a bearing on the attitudes of soldiers and bearing on the attitude of us, and had a bearing on the way people looked at the army, like the house suits, the own suits, and what the tactics were like. Another thing that happened, they played back the um, funeral of the ambush to us, and I think we better off they hadn't. Uh, it was very sad, and uh, it was very upsetting. I should also mention, the death of a, a company sergeant, uh, Felix Grant, who was the senior NCO in our company, tragically died on the 3rd of October. He was a big loss to the company at such an early stage. The tracks would be torn up here and there. At one stage, there was 300 yards of track torn up, and we were surrounded by belugas. Fine ambush. Here we were all sitting ducks in the train. But anyway, our uh, interpreters, he, he, he negotiated on our behalf and, and he got them to cool down. And uh, eventually we got them to fix the track and we moved on. I was approached by the Congolese con conductor of a train who rushed up to me saying, there's a Belgian gone berserk back in the carriage. He's, he's firing his pistol, putting holes through the roof of the carriage. So I grabbed my sergeant and the two of us went down and we found this guy, he was delirious from drugs or drink and so we just disarmed him. But it was then we knew we weren't on the, on the train to Cork. On October 28th, 1960, Colonel Justin McCarthy was killed in a vehicle accident in Leopoldville, now called Kinshasa, in the Republic of the Congo. He was the first Irish officer to be killed and as Deputy Chief of Staff, he is to date the most senior officer to be killed on overseas service. Just two months into the mission, little thought had been given to the question of where the burial would take place and how the remains would be transported to the place of burial. In Justin McCarthy's case, it was decided to transfer the remains by sea from the Congo for burial in Dublin. The only sea route available was from the port of Matadi in the Congo Tenerife, the Belgian port of Antwerp, and thence to Dublin via a short stopover in the port of Cork. The journey of over 6,000 miles took place over three weeks from the 7th of November and arrived in Dublin on November 30th. The lead casket containing the remains of Colonel McCarthy were received at the Leopoldville train station by Lieutenant Colonel Ferdia Lee and Lieutenant Paddy McNally. These two officers escorted the remains from Leopoldville all the way to Glasnevin Cemetery in Dublin. Lieutenant McNally, later Coroner McNally, recorded the passage home on his home movie camera.
It is salutary to recall that as the SS Charlesville departs Matadi, bearing the remains of Colonel McCarthy, some 1,500 miles to the east, the Niamba ambush is taking place. Such was the number of casualties at Niamba and the shock to the army and Ireland as a whole, the death of Colonel McCarthy was somewhat overshadowed. At Antwerp Dock, the casket reposes at the port mortuary. A simple ceremony takes place at the quayside, attended by the First Secretary Irish Embassy, the Honorary Irish Consul at Antwerp, Colonel Bell representing the Belgian Army, together with Lieutenant Colonel Lee and Lieutenant McNally. The casket is loaded on the Celtic shipping line ship, the MV City of Waterford, for cars to Dublin with a stopover at Cork. At Cork, the casket remains in the hold of the ship and some local dockers take the opportunity to pay their respects. There was no time between his being told that he was being transferred from Gaza to the Congo even to come home. And we never saw him again. Then it all ended when uh, I was collected from school one day and taken home and my mother told me that my father had died. In a car crash that morning, um, and then our life changed. During the most difficult moments in our lives, we find solace in happy remembrance of those who brought happiness into our lives, and thus gave us strength to accept the inevitable bereavements which life itself faces us with. At this moment, when I cannot be present to say my last farewell to my life's companion, I find solace and contentment in the belief and conviction that Justin has laid down his life in service to better the future of the next generation in which his young son will participate. My hope and belief is that his son will live to be proud of his father's contribution to this end. We are with you in spirit and in our prayers. This urban scene is Leopoldville in late 1960 with Congolese protesting in support of the deposed Premier Patrice Rumumba. The protest is set to coincide with the visit of the United Nations Secretary General. The troops are from the Indonesian battalion stationed in Leopoldville and the unit is conducting local security operations. Some of its elements are portrayed in crowd control configuration in the vicinity of Camp Martini and the UN headquarters. The UN Sikorsky helicopter arriving at force headquarters is transporting United Nations Secretary General Hammarskjöld and his party. This visit is conducted in the context of continuing problems with the government's stability the international pressure to reinstate Lumumba and the widespread political turmoil. All of this at a time when the mandate for the force is scheduled for renewal. Meantime, following his appointment as force commander, Lieutenant General Sean McKeown attended an inaugural welcome parade in Leopoldville in January 1961. His predecessor, General Von Horn, had returned to Onso in Jerusalem. The parade was attended by representatives of troop contributing nations and the host government is represented by the unmistakable Colonel Mobutu. He would feature in many guises in the future of the Congo. The parade itself is a historic occasion for the force. It is also an impressive event considering the number of troops on parade, their countries of origin, and the variety of military traditions, uniforms, and arms drill on display. As Lieutenant General McKeown departs from the parade ground, it is worth reflecting on the fact that in less than six months from the initial positive response by government 
regarding participation in the Congo mission, Ireland had deployed two battalions to the mission area, overcame the operational challenges, adjusted to difficult climatic conditions, incurred fatal casualties in the course of those duties, and now provided its own chief of staff as force commander. Congo was responsible, I think, for creating the defence forces we have today, that Ireland is a world leader in peacekeeping. It's a signature of our foreign policy, part of our international identity, that our defence forces, the men and women of our defence forces, are peacekeepers. And that goes back to what the pioneering battalions did in Kivu, in Katanga, in Goma, in Elizabethville, in the summer of 1960. The Congo deployment was it wasn't Ireland's first involvement in peacekeeping because small groups of officers had been sent uh, to the UNSO and UNIGIL missions in, um, in Israel and, and in Lebanon in 1958. But this was the first big deployment. We have soldiers all over the world now who have become the best peacekeepers ever. I think they're the best in countries. They're showing themselves to be highly capable and willing to do their jobs. And we are proud of the fact that we were the first to do that. The uh, soldiers uh, were extraordinary young men. 17, 18, young men who matured fairly quickly, I can tell you. They were so good, I'd have gone anywhere in the world with them. Well, the last couple of weeks, you can appreciate, everybody gets very careful. They're not going to get shot, they're not going to crash a truck, or get into any trouble if they can help it. So it was a kind of an easing down. I remember the last day we packed our bags, our kit bags, and onto the plane, and back the same way again. Nigeria and Queen's Air Base in Libya and back to Dublin. From Cork to the Congo, from Galway to the Gaza Strip, from this legislative assembly to the United Nations, Ireland is sending its most talented men to do the world's most important work, the work of peace. Twenty-six sons of Ireland have died in the Congo. Many others have been wounded. I pay tribute to them and to all of you for your commitment and dedication to world order.